Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. What a week it's been. What a week it's been in films. Christopher Nolan says Hollywood films are too gimmicky. That's Christopher Nolan, the director of Memento, Inception, The Prestige, and The Following. The Following. Jesus Christ. If that film was any more unwatchable, it would be radio. <laughs> Christopher Nolan complaining that films are gimmicky is like Ang Lee complaining films are boring. <laughs> Christopher Nolan won't make films in 3D either, which I salute. Can you imagine if he did? The 3D is so real, it's like you can reach out and punch it in its stupid, condescending face. <laughs> in honour of Christopher Nolan, these have been smart jokes for idiots. And they're going to go on far longer than they need to. <laughs> he does drag it out, doesn't he? The last time I saw someone extend a middle section to such needlessly grotesque lengths, I was watching The Human Centipede. <laughs> Now, The Human Centipede has its critics, but to be fair to it, it starts well, but the ending's shit. <laughs> Monty Python are performing live shows at the O2 at the moment. I don't know, I'm surrounded by sycophants, paying £100 to watch men in their 70s relive their youth. It's like going to my first sci-fi convention. <laughs> <laughs> Evil Dead star Bruce Campbell wants to make a horror version of The Expendables, featuring horror movie acting legends. They're the sort of actors who played Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers. The thing is, watching The Expendables, none of those masks is scarier than Mickey Rourke's actual face. (laughs) And finally, John Wayne's heirs are suing Duke University for plagiarism and brand issues regarding the Duke nickname. Uh, This follows on from a similar dispute they had with the University of Draft Dodging Cowards and a horrible, horrible racist, but to be fair, he is great in Rio Bravo Community College. (laughs) And so concludes the jokes, inverted commas, of the week about movies. Yes, 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 thank you, thank you. Uh, not only am I a massive fan of all films, I used to work in cinema. Well, a cinema. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has worked in a cinema. Yes, is it, did you like it? I loved it. Did you? Because I didn't like working in a cinema. Uh, well, it wasn't awful. I just found it very disappointing because you think, I like movies, I love movies, I love movies. What's the best job I could possibly have? Working in a cinema. That's going to be the best job ever. And then I realised you don't have to know anything about films to work in a cinema because you're basically just a glorified cleaner. And your whole job is to clean up popcorn after people who can't carry it from point A to point B without spilling it on the floor and then walking away as if it had nothing to do with them whatsoever. And I, I used to work in, sort of in the late 90s. I was there for the golden era, the halcyon days of uh, you know, Phantom Menace. Those was Toy Story 2. Oh, you know, the golden era. Because uh, Star Wars is massively popular. They'd be on... On the hour, every hour, 10 till 10. On the hour, every hour, 10 till 10. Now, that seems like quite an obvious, like, decipherable thing. But people come in, they go, so I see you've got Star Wars on at 10 and on at 11. Does that mean it's only 45 minutes long? <laughs> and I'd say, yeah, yeah, it is. I wouldn't waste your time. Go and, go and see a simple plan. It's much better. It's like Sam Raimi doing the Coen Brothers. Brilliant. Uh, and they go, oh, so it's, on at, so it's on the hour, every hour, 10 till 10. Yeah, on the hour, every hour, 10 till 10. Right. So if I was to come in about half past two... Well, you'd be a bit late or a bit early, depending on which film you were looking for, because it's on the hour, every hour, 10 till 10. And the other thing I used to do, which was uh, good, because I said, like, you were talking earlier uh, in bits you didn't hear, so I don't know why I'm bringing it up for this part of the podcast, but, uh, you know, disliking young people because I'm a miserable old person. Uh, But even when I was technically young, I hated even those who are still yet younger than me. And I used to get really annoyed with kids, and I used to sort of try to use my working in the box office to annoy kids and ruin their lives, or at least their day. Uh, Hopefully their lives, mainly their day. Because I know what it's like to be bothered in the cinema, and I'd go in beyond the box office, and you'd see this queue queuing up, and you just see these these, group of like 10, 12 kids, and you kind of go, oh, you you, you should know, like your spidey sense is tingling. You're like, they're the kids who are going to ruin this. They're going to ruin this for everyone. They're going to ruin this for everyone. I know them. They're the ones who are going to talk. They're going to do this, and you're like, so I'm like, I'm on boxes selling tickets. I'm furious, furious, like watching them come in, knowing that I would hate to have them in the cinema screen. I was watching the movie on, but I didn't know what to do. So what I would do is, because they're all horrible and you're all mouthy and sweary and you know the worst stereotypes of Essex, sort of in, in child form, and I'd spot like the alpha male, the alpha male. I don't know if you can be an alpha male when you're like 11 years old, but we'll say like the the the, the ringleader. The one who's got sort of like two gold earrings and a baseball cap, and you can sort of smell the cigarettes and his breath from across the room, and he's just mouthy and swearing. And you're like, right, right, singled him out, right. They come up with like 12, 12, 12 tickets for Austin Powers Spy Shag Me, please. And I'd always say, no. 
And I'd point to the ringleader and I'd say, because you're not old enough. <laughs> so the entire group failed to get in because uh, their leader had failed them, uh, hoping they would take him out into the streets of South Anuncia and kick the shit out of him in some sort of Lord of the Fly style retribution. It was, uh, it was the nearest I ever got to Battle Royale in real life. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nathaniel Metcalf! <laughs> Hello, thrill seekers. <laughs> We're trying out a new catchphrase. I think it works. It definitely works. Start off with some film jokes. I mean, I find that most of my set do tend to be film jokes anyway, but I'll start off with some short ones. Ray Parker Jr. once sang, I ain't afraid of no ghosts, which sounds very brave until you remember, of course, that that is a double negative. So what he's actually saying is, I am afraid of some ghosts. <laughs> Which, if anything, just shows he has the bravery of any normal man. <laughs> in 1972, Marlon Brando had the last tango in Paris. And that's why you can only get Orangina and Fanta there now. <laughs> my favourite. <laughs> the next Christmas they're going to release a new Star Wars movie. Exciting about that? Yeah, yeah that's their general reaction. Um, uh, but yeah, um, but it was interesting because when they made the prequels, I remember George Lucas saying that they were never going to make any more Star Wars films because he claimed that the entire Star Wars saga was basically just a story of Darth Vader. His becoming a Jedi in the prequels, his switch to the dark side, and his eventual redemption and death at the end of Return of the Jedi. But if you apply that same logic to EastEnders, <laughs> that means that its entire 29-year run is basically just a story of Ian Beale. <laughs> All the guns, gangsters, and dreary, depressing storylines are really only subplots <laughs> that occasionally affect the life of a small businessman. <laughs> and he's not even the best businessman in the world, is he? This is a man who thinks it's a good idea to open a chip shop on the same street in competition with a cafe that he also owns. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Metcalf, you have messed up here, haven't you? Because you've forgotten about .com, haven't you? She's also been an EastEnder since it started, so couldn't your previous flight of fancy about Ian Beale just as easily have been applied to her? Oh no, it couldn't. Because June Brown, the actress who plays Doc Cotton, left the show between the years 1994 and 1997. So who looks stupid now? <laughs> Nathaniel Metcalf! Well, now it's time to introduce our special headline act, who, for this very special episode, is also the act you just listened to. So please welcome back Nathaniel Metcalf! Hello. <laughs> uh, now, for those of you who uh, don't know who you are, could you tell people who you are? I presume you're talking to me and not the audience. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Metcalf. I am a sometime comedian, and I also work in a comic book shop. I am uh, fairly, uh, I'm a fairly, I'd say I'm half successful. <laughs> uh, Nathaniel works in a comic shop where whenever I spend any free time in London, I go in and bother him and keep him from doing his job <laughs> under the pretext of maybe occasionally buying a comic, but basically just having a chat and keeping you from admin. Yeah. The question I'm most often asked from most people, they say, oh, it must be a brilliant job, this. But you just read all the books all day. No. I mean, that's not something you take to someone that works in a clothes shop, though, is it? <laughs> you wouldn't go, what do you do for it? I work in H&M. You go, oh, it must be a brilliant job. But you just wear all the clothes. <laughs> you must be boiling. <laughs> Doesn't work. 
No, no. That's the thing. I always think at lots of jobs you have. They like working somewhere. Everybody goes, it must be brilliant. You know, you get to watch all the films you don't. Like working in a comic shop, I imagine, is uh, is not like some sort of Kevin Smith fantasy. I imagine it's more sort of like... It's a bit like know. admin. It's a bit like trying to do a, an office job where every five minutes someone bothers you. <laughs> <laughs> um, mainly spreadsheets. It is. They don't do that in Kevin Smith films, do they? <laughs> Have you had other jobs, interesting other jobs, or have you just... Well, I had quite uh, a nice sort of, quite movie-related job when I left university. I worked in a picture library, and my job was generally to, it, it was to identify photographs. So the picture library ma- mainly was used for, like, TV listings and if they had any sort of weird images to put in. So what we'd often get, my job was I'd get, like, a pile of photographs, and I'd have to try and identify what the film was just by looking at the photograph. And it was great. Like it was like just trying to pick out one actor and just scouring IMDb, trying to figure out what weird film this could possibly be from. And this is back in the days when IMDb wasn't quite the no. fully extensive. Uh, no, it was uh, it was when it was patchy, yeah. patchy at best. There were there were there were for, for for years. I had videos, you know, I collect videos that uh, were not listed on IMDb, and you were like, this, I technically this doesn't exist. It's like, you know, <laughs> Which is incredible, but yeah, to try and imagine trying to do stuff before the internet. Imagine that. <laughs> imagine this would be so pointless. I know. <laughs> even more, but even more pointless. <laughs> it's a, like it's an annoying skill that I, you know I'll have forever, but it's worthless. <laughs> but I still think what a great job it is. Who's that? I've no idea, but I'm going to spend the next half hour trying to find out. <laughs> and there'll be so, always something like it'd be the best ones that have something like. There'd be someone you'd vaguely seen. He'd go, I think I saw him once on Mork and Mindy. But it'll be in a film where he's got like a kangaroo behind him. He'd go, this looks amazing. <laughs> so you saw, you saw about the oasis of the, was it Shockwaves was the, uh, the yeah, film Shockwaves to search. Yeah, Shockwaves is the Bro. one I really, that I came across, which is a film that uh, sort of saw some, a uh, couple of odd pictures of uh, sort of zombies. It's Nazi zombies. Um, As if zombies are, or Nazis aren't bad enough. It's from 1976. And when I looked out, John Carradine and Peter Cushion in it. And I remember going, this is going to be the best. This is basically my favourite film that I've never seen. <laughs> and then a couple of years later, it got re- released in the States, and I watched it, and you go, it's all right. It's a bit disappointing. But it makes you think, when you see films like that, it makes you think that every film that you could con- possibly conceive was already made in the 70s. <laughs> it just hasn't come out yet. They're all out. Which one? Sharknado. Sharknado, yeah. Yeah, they had to make that one last year. Yeah. That was the one they missed. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, the time is right. It was like the, the, the stars are in alignment. Finally, cinema is ready for Sharknado. <laughs> Cinemas were never ready for Sharknado. They've been there. That's the thing, although, yeah, I did try and sort of watch Sharknado, but it's one of those things you go, I just, it's the sort of thing I'm happier it exists as a film rather than actually sitting through and watching it, you know, it's yeah. like, oh, that was really, I like the idea that you thought, what's worse than a tornado, sharks in a tornado. I kind of, I, I don't really like, have a long time. They're the kind of films I always think that even the people that made them don't care if you watch them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm easy about it. Don't bother. Don't bother. You sort of see an old clip of it and you go... That'll do. I think it's That'll like the, the cinematic equivalent of when, like, where you live because they've got to spend all the money before the tax is that they just put mini <laughs> roundabouts in and things. And they just go, Sharknado, Sharknado, we need to, we need to spend like a hundred grand immediately. Sharknado 3, go. Uh, someone's going to get some tax and we can justify our budget for next year. It's just needless. You know, some people like them, but, uh, you know, idiots. <laughs> also, like that they end up going, what's Debbie Gibson up to? Put her in the film. <laughs> Put her in the film. Yeah, it's no, the idea. no one else thinks like that. No one. The idea of the uh, the special superstar guest star <laughs> that no one's heard of for thirty. You know, it's like you know we've got we've got Eric Estrada in this. It's gonna yeah. fucking blow people's minds <laughs> that we managed to get Eric Estrada. Hey, who thought we could? One of them <laughs> had uh, one of them had Debbie Gibson and Tiffany in in the same film, which I reckon in those kind of eighties pop star terms would be like the equivalent of watching Heat. <laughs> now that, I'd watch that. I'd watch <laughs> a heat remake. A heat remake with, <laughs> with sort of eighties female pop stars. Now we're talking. I mean, it's in production, isn't it? Yeah. It will be in production. We could get uh, Vanessa Parody to be the sort of Val Kilmer character. Yeah. That'd be great. 
It's almost like you've thought about this already. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. It's one of your unproduced screenplays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see so the draw. Yeah, the draw. This draw. The draw of the draw in my noggin, where I file everything away for later use. <laughs> it's, a, it's a depressing draw. <laughs> I collect like videos and things, and uh, I ended up uh, with seven VHS copies of the film Tapeheads. <laughs> Uh, because I love the film Tape Heads, but that's not it's not worth it's not worth seven copies of it. Uh, let's be honest. It's a great. I don't know if you've seen the film Tape Heads. Anyone seen Tape Heads? Tape Heads? Tape Heads? It's a uh, John Cusack, Tim Robbins movie about music video producers in the eighties. Really good. It's uh, the sort of it's not it's is it it's like Michael Nesmith presents. So it's not like it's one of those sort of like the same people sort of sort of the same people did Repo Man. It's kind of really good. And uh, yeah, it's really good. But it was one of those films that back is before the internet and when there was no DVDs, it was in the cinema store. Cinema, Do you remember the cinema yeah, store yeah. where you had to go and get ripped off by yeah. smug arseholes? <laughs> and then the internet came about and you went, no, I don't have to go in there anymore. Because yeah. uh, it's on DVD and it costs £3. So. Yeah, £25 I spent yeah. on the Ipcris file. <laughs> Just because the one in the UK was pan and scan. <laughs> I've, got, I've got nightmare stories like that. Yeah. <laughs> This is like this is like a, an Alcoholics Anonymous thing. <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous things you spent twenty five pounds on in the cinema store for no good reason. Well, I saw it because I know my friends were going to get it as well. So we went to see the tape heads. He was like thirty quid, not thirty quid. I went to the like, local charity shop near me, uh, which used to be called Golden Disc, which was brilliant and uh, has destroyed the sort of foundations of the, <laughs> the house <laughs> because it just the walls are covered in shelves of videos that are you know destroying it. And it was three quid, so I bought one. They had like loads of different copies of it, so I bought it. Thinking, oh, my friends wanted a copy as well, so I ended up buying copies, but they also found them cheap. And I ended up, and then because it was like Christmas, I got, oh, you know you went that film tape, but I found it for three quid. So I ended up, basically, I now own like seven VHS copies <laughs> of tape heads. What sort of stuff do you like when it comes to uh, films? Do you have a specific... Do you mean, I know, obviously, I know you like everything. I know you're prepared yeah, for it in the game, really but do you do have like... a sort of genre thing that you like? I don't know if I like genre films. I like films which have got uh, British actors from the 60s in, essentially. Essentially, if you've seen them turn up for, like, a minute in a Hammer film, I'll be looking for a film they were in 10 years earlier where they were starring in. I like films, basically where for no reason Sid James pops up for five minutes as a cab driver and then drives off. <laughs> Essentially, you go, ah, oh, Sid James. I like it when it just... I like films where people just pop up for five minutes and you go, oh, perfect, Arthur Lowe. Yeah. That's what I like. Basically, if I watch Theatre of Blood, it's like a tick list of everyone I like. <laughs> it's like, this is, this is ideal. This was made for me. So essentially what you're saying is you like uh, sex comedies from the 70s. I do. I do <laughs> yeah, well, like yeah, of course. Who, who doesn't? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's what we had instead of a film industry in the 70s, was yeah, essentially yeah. sex films. We decided to not make any films apart from about three. It's basically Get Carter, sort of like Theatre of Blood, and then nothing yeah. till The Long Good Friday. Yeah. And even that was essentially a, a TV movie. In a way, it's well. kind of depressing. You can look at it in a negative way and go, it's a shame all these amazing classically trained actors ended up having to be in these terrible movies. Or you can just go, brilliant. Like I do. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Where's my shortbreads? Have a shortbread and a cup of tea. Watch the theatre of blood on. Yeah. But what's weird about the sex comedies is they're really not sexy. That's the thing I was finding. Oh, not really at all. Weird. Not in the slightest. It's really weird. We watch it, you're going to go, if you're watching this like to laugh, or for titillation, you're going to sort of be disappointed on both counts. But there's something very charming about them, even yeah. though they're sort of really weird and sleazy and well, they're quite, gratuitous. They're, they've got, you know, it'll be weird because it'll be like, they'll have like Linda Bellingham in, who's now in like Loose Women. And they're sort of, a, they're slightly grubby. And I'd say they're almost <laughs> charmless. But because of that, they're so charmless, they almost do the full circle. There you go. <laughs> And then Sid James will show up in a cab or Roy Kinnear and I'll go, it's all right, yeah. it's all right. John Lemesrier will see yeah. someone without a top on and faint yeah. because that's what happened in the 70s. If you saw anyone with any clothes on, you fainted. Yeah. Because uh, fo- you couldn't photograph it and put it on the internet, you couldn't Instagram it, you had to faint. But it also made that these films were like kind of blockbuster. I can't imagine <laughs> people queuing around yeah. a block yeah. to see like a, a yeah. film. It's amazing that Jaws was the summer blockbuster and not, you know... <laughs> Rose Dixon, Night Nurse, or whatever it was. So the other thing we do is we do a hashtag game where we try and come up with like a like a hashtag game. We play film joke round. So so this week it's cheese movies. Uh, we've got uh, the longest yarg. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Danish blue is not the only colour. <laughs> Fetteroff <off> dead. <laughs> and uh, Battle Groyeur. I add uh, the fromage of innocence. <laughs> I went French. Uh, Tarka the ricotta. <laughs> uh, bringing up Baby Bell. <laughs> I mean, I feel that my, my cheeses are a slightly lower class of cheese. Than yes. Yeah, but people have heard of your cheeses. Yeah. Uh, Rockfort Apache. Uh, cheddar. Uh, mozzarella Enchanted. And uh, Bridget Jones's Dairy Lee. Uh, you could also have the Quark Knight. Uh, East of Edam or Edam, Edam Busters uh, Donny Rasco Paneer Dark and uh, Die Hard 2 Die Harza which I've never heard of that cheese but uh, it works as far as the joke goes just works better written down and I think we can agree the winner was Jennifer <laughs> So now we come to the part of the show where the headline act, Nathaniel Metcalf, uh, chooses his scenes from favourite scenes from films, his favourite beginning, uh, middles and ends. And then we will act them out for you so you get to enjoy us being in his perfect movie. Uh, so would you like to tell us what your favourite opening to any film ever is? Uh, my favourite opening to any film is from A Matter of Life and Death. Have you seen that? Has anyone seen that in the room? So it's a David Niven movie. It's a Power and Pressburg movie from the 40s, um, which is essentially someone who falls in love, a fighter pilot, who falls in love with someone in these dying moments and then is kind of, uh, doesn't die when he's supposed to. And so the rest of the movie is kind of a trial to find out whether he's allowed to live or die because he's fallen in love with this woman and whether, and it's a kind of sort of metaphysical, heavenly court case essentially about whether he's allowed to live and spend the rest of his life with this woman or whether he has to die because he was predestined to die in this plane crash essentially during the war. It's also quite interesting because uh, the stuff in heaven is in black and white and the stuff in like, life is colour, yeah, which yeah, you would yeah. think would sort of be the other way around. Yeah. It's quite good. It's one of those kind of stiff upper lip British movies that um, that's often parodied this, but I think a lot of people don't know it's where it comes from. And it's really kind of, uh, yeah, it's all very sort of ridiculously over the top, but because it's David Niven doing it, it feels like there's something kind of quite charming and centred. So rather than seeming over the top, it seems... Kind of, it's quite moving and quite uh, sort of. It is silly, but it's almost because he's doing it. It kind of sort of centres it, and makes it, makes it all right. I think anyone else doing it, I think you wouldn't really get away with it. So that's why I'm going to do it now. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the character I'm going to play, a woman, is uh, played by Kim Hunter, who you might know from the first Planet of the Apes movie. Yeah. And I always forget that she's in Planet of the Apes. I don't. Great. No, no. I don't. <laughs> she was she was uh, blacklisted as a commie, wasn't she? Because oh, she, she? Uh, she did a lot of charity work, and so like a lot of people who who give a shit about people, <laughs> they were they were branded an enemy of the state. Because <laughs> how can caring about anyone not be anything other than in conflict with the wishes of the government? <laughs> seems to be the case. That's not. It's a bit believable. But it just seems very weird that she wasn't even a communist. She just give a shit about people. <laughs> Never work again, you commie. <laughs> Which is why her IMDb page is mainly bits of telly when she's really good and a great actress. Was she in disguise when she was in Planet of the Apes? Eh? No, they no. <laughs> <Say> no. No. <laughs> uh, no, but she she was um, she was weirdly. I think she was weird. She was in the first Power. Well, not. But she was in Canterbury Tale as like a little cameo sort of thing. But then they sort of chose her as if she was like an unknown. They'd never seen her when they did this. So they had the story that like they found it, but they must have known who she was because she yeah, was in okay. their movies. It's a very odd sort of story that. She was hired to do stuff for Hitchcock to like do auditions, but she was the person who read the scripts off camera. So and they heard her voice, and like the voice, they were just trying to find whether she had the voice, like the face, to go with the voice to be this part. This is kind of one of those sort of accidental things that happens a lot in kind of British movies from then on, where they'll have like one American actor, so they can try and sell it abroad. But this has seemed to happen almost accidentally. It's got just that one of the characters happens to be an American woman. Um, and this was this was made like about a year after the end. Of the, it's it's so close to the actual Second World War. It's like a year later, isn't it? Is it forty six? I think. Yeah. So it's like only, the war's only actually been over for for like a year. So it's all very soon and close, and it must all have been like very. Um, 
in, in, it's all in very recent memory, uh, which makes it weirder to have this kind of strange, kind of heavenly, kind of mystical fantasy film that's essentially about something where people would have just had people dying and things. Also, I'd say now that I don't know if I can do this justice, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't watch the film. Also, this is this is also the thing I, is the opening of the movie, and it's one of those things where the setup is basically the lead character about to die. And you go, this is the opening five minutes. So it feels like it should be right at the end of something. It feels like there's already been a movie you haven't seen, which is annoying. Imagine it feels like you must have come in halfway through. And also, this is the cinematography by Jack Cardiff, who also did Rambo 2. <laughs> so that's how long his career was. He went all the way up to like Rambo 2. And oh, brilliant, like great, great cinematographer. Uh, did the thing with the le- on the lens, because we were going to fade up from black on the beach, and it was didn't like it, it was cheesy. So he just breathed on the lens, and then it, as the condensation cleared, that was the effect they used, which is uh, I think, actually, cool. I think this is probably... I quite like quite sentimental films, I realise, now when I look through this stuff. <laughs> so that's another thing I think. I think quite like sort of sentiment, but what I quite like is quite a depressing sentiment. <laughs> I quite like it. It's quite charming. It makes me sad, but it's essentially something funny will happen, and hopefully Sid James will show up in a cab at some point. <laughs> that's what. That's all I'm, I'm holding out for. But um, they're really funny, and it's that kind of sort of it's stiff upper lip, but sort of making fun of it, but sort Flipping, of celebrating it? it and being very. It's very British, in the sort of best possible way. I think stuff like this, and it's kind kind of talking about how people are, are essentially incredibly brave, but they're, they're but they're also sort of ridiculous, posh human beings. <laughs> <laughs> so a matter of life and death. So I should point out, better man should point out, if you've not seen the film, uh, I am a woman, uh, an American woman, who's on sort of the, the radio, and David Niven is in a plane that's sort of crashing, basically, isn't yeah, it? Like, he's about to crash, and he's got no parachute. But he's just trying, so he's basically just trying to talk to someone, essentially, as you find out. Yeah, and this is how the film starts. So it's just like a great way, yeah, it's a great sort of... Uh, you know, it would be, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be a pre-title sequence now, wouldn't it? Be like the sort of, and it ends, bang, yeah. credits roll, da da da, <laughs> matter of life, da, da, well, da, there's da, a prequel da. where this is the end, and at the end it says to be continued. Yeah, <laughs> uh, matter of life and death. Are you ready? I'm ready. Request your position. Request your position. Come in, Lancaster. Come in, Lancaster. Position nil. Repeat nil. Age twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Did you get that? It's very important. Education interrupted, violently interrupted. Religion, Church of England, politics, conservative by nature, labour by experience. What's your name? I cannot read you, cannot read you, request your position. Can you see our signals? Oh, give me my scallop shell of quiet, my staff of faith to walk upon, my strip of joy, a mortal diet, my bottle of salvation, my gallon of glory, hope's true gauge, and thus I'll find my pilgrimage. So Walter Raleigh wrote that. I'd rather have written that than flown through Hitler's legs. I can't understand you. Hello, Lancaster. We are sending signals. Can you see our signals? Come in, Lancaster. Come in, Lancaster. But at my back, I always hear time's winged chariots hurrying near. And yonder all before us lie. Deserts of vast eternity. Andy Marvel. What a marvel. What's your name? Are you receiving me? Repeat, are you receiving me? Request your position. Come in, Lancaster. You seem like a nice girl. I can give you my position. Instruments gone. Crew gone, too. All except Bob here, my sparks. He's dead. The rest all bailed out of my orders. Time? 033. Do you get that? Crew bailed out 033. Uh, Station Warrenden Bomber. AG George. Send them a signal. Got that? Station Warrenden Bomber. Group A Apple. G George. They'll be sorry about Bob. We all liked him. Hello, G. George. Hello, G. George. Are you all right? Are you trying to land? Do you want to fix? Name's not G. George. It's P. Peter. Peter D. Carter. D's for David. Squadron leader Peter Carter. No, I'm not going to land. Undercarriage is gone. In a port's on fire. I'm bailing out presently. I'm bailing out. Take a telegram. Got your message. Received your message. We can hear you. Telegram, my mother. Mrs. Michael Carter. 88 Hampstead Lane, London, North West. 88 Hampstead Lane, London. Tell her that I love her. You'll have to write this for me. But what I want her to know is that I love her very much. And I've never shown it to her. Not really. But that I've loved her always. Right up to the end. Give my love to my two sisters too. Don't forget them. Received your message. We can hear you. Are you wounded? Repeat. Are you wounded? Are what? you bailing out? What's your name? June. Yes, June. I'm bailing out. I'm bailing out. But there's a catch. I've got no parachutes. 
Hello, hello, Peter. Do not understand. Hello, hello, Peter. Can you hear me? Hello, June. Don't be afraid. It's quite simple. We've had it, and I'd rather jump than fry. After the first 1,000 feet, what's the difference? I shan't know anything anyway. I say, I hope I haven't frightened you. No, I'm not frightened. Good girl. Your Sparks, you said he was dead. Hasn't he got a shoot? Cut to ribbons. Cannon shell, June. June, are you pretty? Oh, not bad. I, uh... <laughs> can you hear me as well as I can hear you? Yes. You've got a good voice. You've got guts, too. It's funny. I've known dozens of girls. I've been in love with some of them. But it's an American girl who I'll never see and never shall see who hear my last words. It's funny. It's rather sweet, June. If you're around when they pick me up, turn your head away. Perhaps we can do something, Peter. Let me report it. No, no one can help. Only you. Let me do this in my own way. I want to be alone with you, June. Where were you born? Boston. Mass? Yes. That's a place to be born. History was made there. Are you in love with anybody? No, don't answer that. I could love a man like you, Peter. I love you, June. Your life and I'm leaving you. Where do you live? On the station? No, in a big country house about five miles from here. Leewood House. Old house? Yes, very old. Good, I'll be a ghost and come and see you. You're not frightened of ghosts, are you? It'd be awful if you were. I'm not frightened. What time will you be home? Well, I'm on duty till six. I have breakfast in the mess and then I have to cycle about half an hour. I often go along the sands and... Oh, this is such nonsense. No, it's not. It's the best sense I've ever heard. <laughs> I was lucky to get you, June. Can't be helped about the parachute. I'll have wings soon, anyway. Big white ones. I hope they haven't gone all modern. I hate to have a prop instead of wings. What do you think the next world's like? I've got my own ideas. Oh, Peter. I think it starts where this one leaves off. Or where this one could leave off if we'd listen to Plato and Aristotle and Jesus. With all our little <laughs> earthly problems solved. But with greater ones worth the solving. I'll know soon enough, anyway. I'm signing off now, June. Goodbye. Goodbye, June. Hello, G. George. Hello, G. George. Hello, G. George. Hello. <laughs> so long, Bob. I'll see you in a minute. You know what you wear by now. Proper wings. Sing. There you go. That's how it starts. That's how it starts. That's the, that's the first five minutes. And from that point on, it's awesome. <laughs> There's a table tennis match and everything. There is. Brilliant. Although David Niven playing 27 is probably the most fantastical thing in the entire <laughs> yeah. world, isn't it? How old are you? 27. <laughs> <laughs> he was never 27. Yeah. Never been 27. Yep. Uh, so what's your next scene you'd like to do? Well, my next scene, after uh, doing a scene in which I play a pilot who's about to die, I thought I'd lighten the mood. With um, a bit of the Elephant Man. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, I've realised as well, I have picked some incredibly sad films. <laughs> Mostly all black and white weepy. Yeah, they movies. are, aren't they? All but one in black and white. <laughs> it's, it says a lot about me. I, re I really do love the Elephant Man, though. It is, it is, uh, I've, I've gone for a particularly sad bit. I mean, there aren't any funny bits. <laughs> um, I've looked... Well, I've looked. you know, because it's produced by Mel Brooks, Mel Brooks isn't, it? isn't it? And that's why he didn't put his name on the credits. He thought people would think it was like Young Frankenstein, you know, like the Elephant Man being like some parody. So he like made it, but didn't put his name anywhere on it because he didn't want people to think it was a comedy because they would go in expecting like something like that. He also did the, the Doctor and the Devils, the same sort of... Uh, he's also oh, yeah. Mel Brooks under the same thing, which is really weird. He made all these weird British... Serious dramas in the sort of mid early yeah. 80s and didn't put his name on it because he didn't want anyone to think they were jokes, you know. But this is David Lynch as well, isn't it? Yeah. David Lynch does kind of British gothic um, in black and white because it's a serious subject, yeah. It's sort of yeah. Legend, yeah. I can just because it's, it's in the olden days, yeah. It's in the olden days, so it's in black and white, yeah. Actually, Mel Brooks really liked your razor head as well, which is one of the reasons he liked the idea of David Lynch doing it. Which is just seems, I mean, I know if you like movies, you like movies, but it just seems weird imagining Mel Brooks at home watching a razor head, just kind of going, This is brilliant. Uh, I, so I so can, a couple of songs, this would be a great, <laughs> yeah. I can imagine Mel Brooks liking yeah, a razor head. Yeah, There's yeah. probably not that much difference between that and like a young Frankenstein, really. There's something they've got a similar. Similar sensibility. There's something in the Venn diagram. He did a great thing where he showed uh, the, the the executives a, a screening of it for like to show the Mel Brooks and the screening, 
and uh, they got loads of notes, and he was really angry about it because <laughs> he said, "I can't try." And, I think I've got the quote right. He goes, "Mel Brooks said to the producers." Uh, we're involved in a business venture. We screen the film for you to bring you up to date as to the status of this venture. Do not misconstrue this as our soliciting the input of raging primitives. <laughs> Which is the sort of person you want producing your movie, I think. <laughs> like, it's very, it is really, really sad, isn't it? Is Although it? it's also <laughs> mostly not true, a lot of it, which is the really weird thing about it, isn't oh, it? Yeah. It's based on the memoirs, and it's sort of based on the sentimentality of the memoirs. So a lot of it isn't really historically accurate. It's just a really sad telling of a story. I quite like a lot of the people that David Lynch cast in it as well, because a lot of them are kind of people who are now, you can look back and go, oh, it's Anthony Hopkins and things. But they're not even like, it's not even when Anthony Hopkins was like a big deal. It's like when he's kind of doing sort of theatre and little bits of kind of bad movies and things. And it's got, one of the best people in The Elephant Man is Freddie Jones, who's one mm. of those kind of forgotten kind of British actors who's absolutely brilliant. And it sort of essentially was making quite bad Hammer movies in the 70s. And casting this, then of course people go, oh, he's great, isn't he? Because he's in a proper film. So it's got like all those kind of little... Michael Elphick in it as well. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> it's got. Little... He's the sort of he's the eighties version yeah. of the people you like <laughs> yeah. in the seventies, yeah. isn't it? But I don't like him. No, um, <laughs> not as much. Not as much. Um, I've got no time for Elphick. <laughs> no time <laughs> for Elphick. Um, yeah, I'm going to do my best to do this without being offensive. Um, <laughs> this is quite difficult as well. But um, this is particularly this is a scene right at the end of the movie, um, and uh, oh. God, I hope people... Have people seen it? Good, because there's some spoilers in this. Um, he's just... It's sort of right near the end, and he's kind of knows... I mean, it's very hard to get through watching this without, like, like being in bits. So hopefully with me doing it, it kind of uh, cushions the blow a bit. <laughs> um, this isn't the famous... You know the famous, the famous line, I am not an animal? Yeah, you know, yeah. You know that's, that scenes, you know that's from this. Are you aware of that bit where he's like, I am not an animal? This takes place about five minutes after that. So yeah. basically he sort of realised that he's only really got weeks to live. And so uh, he's back with the doctor who's been looking after him. And the doctor basically decides he's going to... He doesn't, he doesn't tell him. The doctor's kind of worked out that he's only got weeks to live. Doesn't tell him, but he kind of knows anyway. He's kind of figured it out for himself. And uh, so it was like a special treat. He's given him, he's taken him to the theatre, which he loves. So he's dressing him up in all his kind of white tie and things. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my is, God. Oh, oh my giddy uh, This is like, you know, this is like every sort of ending of The Little Is Hobo. <laughs> just sort of put into one. Be like, why is he leaving? We'd be so happy if he stayed with that family. <laughs> it's imagine that, but imagine like that times a thousand. That's how yeah. sad this is. Yeah. And no doubt, us two doing it will be the perfect, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the That's perfect sad, antidote yeah. to how sad the film is. <laughs> so yeah, so you're are you, you going to be? You I'll be, be John Merrick. Maybe John Merrick. It I'll be, be uh, Frederick Treves or yeah. Scott Hopkins. The Elephant Man. <laughs> It's not funny. It's not funny. This is it. How, how do I look? Splendid. You will not look out of place. You look absolutely splendid. Splendid. Shall we go? Again, I can't tell you how sorry I am for what happened. See, I had no idea. Really. Please, you mustn't blame yourself, Mr. Trees. Don't worry about me, my friend. I am happy every hour of the day. My life is full because I know that I am loved and I have gained myself. I could not say that were it not for you. Well, and I, and I, you have done so much for me as well. Thank you. So I'll fetch Mrs. Mother's head and Nora and be back in a few minutes. Yes, very good, my friend. My my friend. See, <sighs> oh, this, this perfect movie show is a laugh a minute. Am I right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> what was I thinking? But genuinely, I'm trying to pick my favourite scenes. All my favourite scenes. I quite like to watch a film and be quite depressed at the end. <laughs> Right, so your next uh, favourite scene from uh, films? Well, this is actually, I think, my favourite film, all told. Uh, and it's It's a Wonderful Life. 
You seen that? Another really cheerful film, <laughs> for, apart from the last ten well, minutes. Well, people, people are mad. People talk about it. It's like this very kind of ridiculously over the top sentimental movie, and it's not. It's basically about a man who's sort of driven to suicide, <laughs> and not even through actual depression, but so he thinks he can get some money from the insurance. <laughs> it's just like it's kind of it's bleak, and um, it's kind of takes someone who's essentially a good man, pushes him to the edge to the point where he's going to kill himself, and then at the end. It's barely, it's it's the sort of release of it just going, oh, God, oh, God. The fact that anything nice happens to him is so kind of, it makes you feel so elated. Um, but I, I love It's Wonderful Life. It's Wonderful Life is a, essentially, um, it's like a Bible. I think it's better, it's sort of, a, it's a better religion, It's a Wonderful Life. I think, like, the best thing you can do is go, I'll try and be like George Bailey. <laughs> that's the best thing you can do in life. If that's what you, you want to be like him. Um and it's just one of those people that sort of stands up for people. This is a... a oh, no, you're going to do some no, facts? No, no, might do some facts. I might do oh. some facts. Well, I was going to say, it's a tragedy that is famously a flop when it came out, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no one liked it when it came out. But uh, it came out a week after William Wyler's film, uh, The Best Years of Our Lives, which was about returning World War II veterans with like massive, terrible injuries and some bloke's hands burned off and they're sort of live. So they'd already had like a lot of weepy Hydra and then like a week after that being a massive hit this also came out we didn't sort of because this is you know back when film just got released and you either saw them or you didn't no, but it, it got, it got big because they put it on um, TV in America at Christmas because it was one of those films where before they'd worked out all the copyright laws like after whatever it was 25, 30 years things just went out of copyright so every little cable station or network went we'll have that because no one owned it so they just started showing it every Christmas like everyone showed it in the States so it became a, a massive thing just because it was essentially free for any kind of network to show it or any kind of cheap sort of tuppenny halfpenny cable TV show so it just got shown everywhere now Universal have bought it back and they will not let that happen again <laughs> And there's weird, like, colourised versions and all. You know, there's lots yeah, of... Like, everyone's yeah. just trying to go, what can we do with It's a Wonderful Life to make more people watch it? Just put it on. Just put it <laughs> on. It's fine. Not pan scan. Let's not have the pan scan uh, it's, 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 it's It's brilliant. It's also, I think, it's about the best screenplay ever written. And it's one of those weird screenplays that's written by about 40 different people mm. and shouldn't work, but it's, like, perfect. You can't... There's not there's not an inch of fat on it. It's all, like... It's about two and a half hours, essentially, in it. But none of it's... None of it's everything in it needs to be in it to make it all work. Well, ironic. Well, ironically, I don't know if I'm using ironically correctly, uh, but interestingly, and I may, be, may not be using that word correctly, <laughs> but uh, you know, for the sake of mentioning something, uh, <laughs> uh, it was actually the people who wrote it because Frank, it's one of the first, I think it's one of the only scripts uh, Capra's got a uh, writing credit on. And apparently the people who actually wrote the original screenplay were furious with what he did to their screenplay. They actually yeah. got the, tried to get the Writers Guild of America to make him take his name off the credits because he just ruined their script. They were furious. So even that's one of those things where you read it, it's brilliant. Yeah. But like that sort of was well, not an accident because obviously Capra wrote it. And, but it was like that wasn't like the thing that got greenlit and was sold to the studios. It was, And apparently, even though it's quite different to the book that it's sort of based on, everyone who likes the book really likes the film version because they think it's done it. That's yeah. one, of, one of the few films of a book that everyone who really liked the book goes, no, it's fair enough, like, which is, never happens. And the central premise of the film, which is the thing that he gets to see his life back and gets to relive his kind of present, that bit of the movie is like 20 minutes. You think it's like the whole thing, but it's like it's essentially just 20 minutes where he gets to see this other side of his life. But that's the bit everyone just thinks of as being the movie. There's nothing to it, really, when you watch it. And then one interesting fact as well, which uh, I say it's interesting. Uh, during the film, you can hear 42 rings, which means, if Clarence is correct, 42 angels have got their wings during the movie. Oh. So that's a little sort of fact or figure for you there, just to sort of throw that out there. You might not want to know that, but I'm going to let you know. That's just nice to know. So it is depressing, but 42 angels have got their wings. Yeah. Well, that's an, I'll go at the end of that as well. In fact, I'll go, but It's a Wonderful Life, within about six or seven minutes... <laughs> it's too much for me. It's wonderful. You just put it on. You just remember. You just remember what's going to happen. Yeah. It's like watching Watership Down. We just like <laughs> the promise. You got know, Watership Down's on in a, a week, right? I just won't. I won't cry. I won't well, cry. Watership Down know. doesn't make me cry. It just terrifies me. I'm terrified yeah, yeah, of Watership yeah. Down. I yeah. was watching it as a kid, and it starts with that weird abstract bit where you got the and sun they... doing that weird stuff, and it starts going, "Go on, run." 
Because if they catch you, they'll kill you. And you've just got other bits where, like, Richard Bryce going, the fields are burning. Like that. And you go, what, what am I watching? What's this? And there's, like, blood coming out of it. And you go, what is this? What is this? Yeah, put, put Watership down on. He's only little. He's like, what's this? I told I've the never baby. been more uh, terrified of watching something. Like, I just want someone to come back in. Like, what have you put in front of me? I've told the babysitter it's all right to put plague dogs on. It'll be fine. <laughs> really. Well, you liked Lady in the Tram, didn't you? I'm sure this will be... Uh... <laughs> That's terrifying. Though. Absolutely terrifying. It's rabbits with half their ears hanging off half of it and things. It's terrifying, film. Yeah. You will know him by the old mark. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway... Run. Prince with a thousand enemies. Because if they catch you... They will kill you. It's like, <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> terrifying film. Brilliant, though. Brilliant film. We should do that. Let's watch it now. Let's do the it. whole of Watership now. <laughs> <coughs> uh, it's a wonderful life we're going to do. Mm-hmm. This is the scene where he meets George. George meets Mr. Potter. Potter's like the baddie. The, the baddie. Villain. And essentially, Potter's <laughs> realised that... Uh, all the way through, George Bailey is trying to run this kind of cooperative housing thing for all the people that live in Bedford Falls. And um, they've realised he's actually making kind of nice houses and things for people. But Potter kind of runs these uh, sort of slum housing that he's trying to get people in. But a lot of the, some of the people that works for Potter basically points out that these houses are basically taking business away from him. And uh, even though he kind of sees them as kind of quite small fry, they're actually... He's housing all these people in town. So Potter's basically trying to stop it by employing him. Um, so in the, he's, the, my character's in a wheelchair and just has this bloke who never really says anything. who's just sort of like yeah, a horrible like, goon yeah. security guard person who just sort of never says anything. But is really menacing as yeah. they confer that that's his sort of henchman. The visual joke in this bit is as well that George goes into his office. Uh, Mr. Potter's in a wheelchair. George sits down on the chair opposite him and his chair's much lower than his, so he has to do this kind of weird. So, interior Potter's office day. Potter is lighting a big cigar, which is just given George. The goon is beside Potter's chair as usual. Thank you, sir. Quite a cigar, Mr. Potter. You like it? I'll send you a box. Well, I suppose I'll find out sooner or later, but what? why exactly did you want to see me about? <laughs> George, now that's just what I like so much about you. George, I'm an old man and most people hate me. But I don't like them either, so it all evens out. You know just as well as I do that I run practically everything in this town but the Bailey Building and Loan. You know also that for a number of years I've been trying to get control of it, or kill it, but I haven't been able to do it. You've been stopping me. In fact, you have beaten me, George, and as anyone in this county can tell you, that takes some doing. Take during the Depression, for instance. You and I were the only ones who kept our heads. You saved the Building and Loan, and I saved all the rest. Yeah, well, most people say you stole all the rest. (laughs) The envious ones say that, George, the suckers. Now, I have stated my side very frankly. Now, now let's look at your side, young man. 27, 28, married, making, say, 40 a week? 45. 45, 45. Out of which, after supporting your mother and paying your bills, you're able to keep, say, 10 if you skimp. A child or two comes along and you won't even be able to save the 10. Now, if this young man of 28 was a common, ordinary yokel, I'd say he was doing fine. But George Bailey is not a common, ordinary yokel. He's an intelligent, smart, ambitious young man who hates his job and hates the building alone almost as much as I do. A young man who's been dying to get out on his own ever since he was born. A young man, the smartest of the crowd. Mind you, a young man who has to sit by and watch his friends go places because he's trapped. Yes, sir. Trapped into frittering his life away, playing nursemaid to a lot of garlic eaters. Do Do I paint a correct picture or do I exaggerate? What's your point, Mr. Potter? My point? My point is I want to hire you. Hi- hire me? I want you to manage my affairs, run my properties. George, I'll start you out at $20,000 a year. Tw- $20,000 $20, a year? You wouldn't mind living in the nicest house in town, buying your wife a lot of fine clothes, a couple of business trips to New York a year, maybe once in a while Europe. You wouldn't mind that, would you, George? Would I? You're not talking to somebody else around here, are you? You know, this is me. You remember me, George Bailey? Oh, yes, George Bailey, whose ship has just come in, providing he has brains enough to climb aboard. Well, what about the building and loan? Oh, confound it, man. Are you afraid of success? I'm offering you a three-year contract of $20,000 a year, starting today. Is it a deal or isn't it? 
Well, Mr. Potter, I, I, I know I ought to jump at the chance, but I just, I just wonder if it'd be possible, you know, to give me 24 hours to think about it. Sure, sure, sure. You go home and talk about it to your wife. I'd like to do that. In the meantime, I'll draw up the papers. All right, sir. Shakes hands. This is the key thing. Okay, George? Okay, Mr. Potter. As they shake hands, George feels physical revulsion. Potter's hands feels like a cold mackerel to him. In the moment of physical contact, he knows he could never be associated with this man. George drops his hands with a shudder. He peers intently into Potter's face. No, no, no. No, wait a minute here. I don't have to talk to anybody. I know right now, and the answer is no. No, Doug, got it. You sit around here and you spin your little webs and you think the whole world revolves around you and your money. Well, it doesn't, Mr. Potter. In the whole vast consider- configuration of things, I'd say you are nothing but a scurvy little spider, you. And that goes for you, too. And it goes for you, too. <laughs> and he's gone. Scene. There we go. <clears throat> so, we come up to the final ending to any film ever. Is it, is it just basically lots of death and crying and misery? No, or is this, it is, this is a slightly this, more upbeat ending. This is an upbeat ending. Uh, this is one that uh, you'll all have seen this. Um, this is one that I remember getting terribly excited when I saw this. It absolutely blew my brain box apart as a little kid. And it, it's, uh, it's the ending of Back to the Future. Uh, yes. and it, it's, a, it's literally like the film's over, but you get this little kind of extra scene, which is just like sort of mind-blowingly exciting. But so it's like, it's like, giving, you, like giving a kid some like Red Bull. And then go, that's the end. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of like ridiculous kind of. That's over now. Go, go, go home. Go home, kids. Yeah, yeah. Give him um, some Red Bull and some uh, cola cubes and then go, go on, have a nap. It does, it's not going to work. <laughs> but it's so good Back to the Future, isn't it? Oh, it's, br- it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Actually, I always think that the um, the ta- Hill Valley, I always think, is it's very kind of Bedford Fallsy. It's got that same thing that It's a Wonderful Life has, all those kind of small town movies. And that and Gremlins does the same thing, doesn't it? It has that kind of... They almost seem to be all based on that kind of... It's a sort of... I think of it as a weird... Sort of almost existing in the same universe, yeah, kind of. Movie, almost so. ambling universe yeah. of where all the towns are the same. <clears throat> and it also has that similar thing, like it's Wonderful Life. I guess it's like going back and changing something, but just done a sort of a weird sort of revision of the same kind of story. But also, what's great about Back to the Future is is that uh, obviously, when you think about Back to the Future properly, think about it. There's a lot of it doesn't sort of make sense or doesn't quite tally up. I'm not saying it's badly. We're just saying there's things you're going to go. You go, well, hang on, why do they name their not name their first kid, Mark, or, you know, blah, blah, blah. But just, you don't care because you have to really sort of make yourself think about yeah. all the things. Because you don't watch it, you go, that's great, it's fine. They go, and everyone's always like, hey, what about this? And you go, never really crossed my mind because it's so entertaining, it's so enjoyable, and it's so well written that yeah. you never really get too pissy with the sort of stupid little things like that, which don't really matter because the film's so awesome. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the thing that makes those people are bad that would say that. Yeah. The, pedant- well, the, the pedants in that are just like, no, you're wrong now. Like, it's just, can we not have back to the future? Can we not just, can we not just say it's all right? <laughs> yeah. But no, it is, this was like, this was sort of my big, absolute favourite film growing up. And and still kind of is. I think I think It's a Wonderful Life has, has tipped the balance now in my in my affection. But this is still kind of, I think about it all the time. This is my big. And it's also responsible for one of the most <laughs> frustrating internet things. Everyone going, today's the day he went. No, it wasn't today. <laughs> Fucking hell, not today. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Just your birthday. 21st of October, 2015. It's fantastic. Yeah, okay. Fantastic. Are you sure that's the right date? Because you could, you're not just got a Photoshop and decided today's the day and you're going to, you know. When you say it's your birthday, does that mean you're, <laughs> you're going to be born? Yes. You're from the future. <laughs> Is this like is this like the Whoa. worst under the sea dance? Are you basically gonna have to have sex with someone tonight to save the future? Is that what's gonna happen? Yeah. Is she here? <laughs> this is this is Back to the Future Four, and the audience watching it are furious. <laughs> I can't believe this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. <laughs> I mean, technically, we do need a woman to be in this uh, oh, yeah. scene. But, I mean, if no one wants to step up and be the woman, I will uh, <coughs> do the woman as well. Who, uh, <laughs> Sid James in the taxi again. <laughs> that, that's the only thing that would make it better. <laughs> yeah, but at the end, it was Sid James. Or, 
They ride through time in a taxi that Sid James drives. <laughs> they could have done a British a carry on Back to the Future. Yeah. Oh my God. I'll put that. I'll put that in the drawer with uh, the eighties uh, <laughs> teen pop star movies. It'd have to be Jim Dale, who's about forty five anyway, playing uh, Marty McFly. Yeah. So this is the. Uh... I really don't think I can do the accent anyway. I think I'll do um, my own voice. That's fine. Well, we, we've, if, you, if you're interested, we have filmed this, actually filmed this, haven't we? And yeah, put it yeah, on YouTube so you can watch us do the ending in my house <laughs> uh, <laughs> with a Mitsubishi and a soda stream <laughs> sort of stuck on the top with masking tape. Uh, it's fine. Uh, but it's quite good. But do you know how many, like, it's got quite a lot of views. One of the my, one of my most popularly viewed videos on YouTube. And the amount of comments who are upset, A, that you're wearing, like, because he's dressed <laughs> like you would imagine Marty McFly to be dressed, not As he is how he actually scene. is at the ending, because he doesn't have his, you know, life preserver on in the last scene, does he? And also the fact that you say assholes and not assholes. I did that on purpose. I know infuriate people but I like to think that the other people are also need to be infuriated <laughs> clearly I'm doing it on uh, it's, it's, it's assholes not assholes yeah yeah, yeah we, we know yeah you are we know yeah <laughs> yeah so I think you're an accent I will do mine I'm going to I be Doc Brown again yeah, okay. but again my Doc Brown it only sounds a little bit like Nixon <laughs> a sort of future armor Nixon not actual Nixon <laughs> Uh, so I apologise in advance for not being able to do anything better than a shit Nixon. Uh, so, you, so basically, the ending: uh, they're in the garage door opens. Martin McFly sees the new truck. Jennifer comes up. I'll be Jennifer. Be just. Be pretty much be the same voice as a Kim Hunter. <laughs> uh, imagine that. Imagine if they remade. Go back in time and remake it with David Niven and, and Kim at the Hunter. End, for some reason, Jennifer's an ape. <laughs> <laughs> What's happened? What's happened in time? Gone back too far. <laughs> oh, God, man, if that was on telly now, I'd love, come on. Let's all just go home and try and watch this film in our heads. So Jennifer sees the truck. Uh, how about a ride, mister? Jennifer, oh, you a sight for sore eyes. Let me look at you. Marty, you're acting like you haven't seen me in a week. I haven't. Are you okay? Is everything all right? Marty looks at his parents. Oh, yeah, everything's great. The DeLorean arrives. Lots of music starts up. Doc Brown gets out excited. Marty, you got to come back with me. Where? Back to the future. Wait a minute. What are you doing, Doc? I need fuel. The plutonium chamber has now been replaced with Mr. Fusion, which is powered by garbage. Doc fuels the car with an empty beer can, etc. Go ahead, quick, get in the car. No, 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 Doc, I just got here. Jennifer's here, we're going to take the new truck for a spin. Well, bring her along, this concerns her too. Wait a minute, Doc, what are you talking about? What happens to us in the future? What, do we all become arseholes or something? No, 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 Marty, both you and Jennifer turn out fine. It's your kids, Marty. Something's got to be done about your kids. Hey, Doc, we... They get in the car, the car pulls out, it's very exciting, the moment. Hey, Doc, we better back up. We don't have enough road to get up to 88. Doc looks at him, flips his sunglasses down. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. The DeLorean takes off and fucking flies! (laughs) It fucking flies! It flies! Oh, my God! Oh, my God, where's the next film coming out? Dad, Dad, where's the second one coming out? This is brilliant! I need a wee! I need a wee! End! (laughs) That also has one of my favourite things in films. That's a great example of it, is where someone says the name of the film in the film. I love that. (laughs) Love it. Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Will you please give uh, thanks to Nathaniel Metcalf? Um, 
Well, that's the end. Uh, thank you very much for listening. If you have enjoyed this, then please like my Facebook page uh, to get updates about live shows, recordings, and more. That's Richard Sanding's Perfect Movie. You can follow me on Twitter at squat underscore Betty. Check out my YouTube videos at user ID Buckham39. And you can check out my website, www.thatawesomemovieguy.com. A special thanks to the Geekatorium at geekatorium.net for all their help in recording and hosting this podcast. Uh, that was Nathaniel Metcalf. I've been Richard Sandling. This was Richard Sandling's Perfect Movie Podcast. Good night! Yeah!